Today's topic, I'm going to be discussing the difference between a pension plan versus a 401k account. And this is the difference between a defined benefit plan versus a defined contribution plan. What do I mean by that? Well, defined benefit plan, the employer is defining what your benefit is going to be. A defined contribution plan, the employer is defining that you can contribute into that plan. So when we're looking at the differences between a pension plan versus a 401k account, a pension plan is setting up a type of retirement for you so that you're giving X amount of years of service to that company, you're being a loyal employee, you're gaining these micro credits that are going to say, okay, if you hit X amount of age or you hit X amount of years of service, we're going to pay you X amount of dollars for either you or you and your spouse until the day you pass away. So the date that you hit your retirement date until the day you pass away, you're going to be receiving lifetime income, monthly lifetime income every single month until the day that you pass away or you and your spouse pass away. And that's the most generic concept of a, of a pension plan. Now with the 401k account, it's the opposite side. That's a defined contribution plan. And what I mean by that is they're defining how much you can contribute into that account. So if you're working for a private institution, you're working for a private company, and they come with their employee benefits package, and they say, okay, here's your uh, health insurance, here's your life insurance, here's your disability or different ancillary related products. And oh yeah, by the way, you could also contribute to this 401k account. What that means is you could take a percentage of your salary and place that aside into, think of it like a retirement bucket. The way on how that bucket grows is by the contributions you're placing into the plan. If the employer is giving you a match, which would be the incentive to place dollars into that 401k account and the combination of your contributions and the rate of return that's coming back. So what determines that rate of return is based on the different investment options that you choose, the different investment allocations that you choose. So if you're super aggressive, and let's say that you're tying your allocations more heavily towards the market and the stock market does very well that year, you're gonna notice gains from or positives from the contributions you're making, uh, positives from the matching money that you're making, and also positives from the rate of return side. You have the power of compound interest that's ultimately growing in that bucket. So then when you're looking at those two angles, so I hope that that makes sense. Now, when you look at these two angles, you're saying, which is better, you know, pension plan or defined contribution plan of, you know, a 401k account, which the really defined contribution plan could be anywhere between 401k account, 403b account, 457 plan, thrift savings plan, 401a. There's a multitude of different things. Just understand that that just means you're placing dollars, you're contributing dollars into a plan. And then the growth of that bucket is really based on the different investment options and how well those investments perform. So it's more of having some sort of certainty versus having some sort of uncertainty. So the examples that I'm going to use is my grandfather. My grandfather worked for the city of New York and he was an elevator mechanic for the city of New York. He was offered a pension plan. My father was an IT director. He was working for different private institutions. He was offered 401k accounts. So when we look at my grandfather's situation, he gave X amount of years of service. Every day he busted his ass working for, this, working for the, the, the city of New York, and they, he knew, okay, as long as I go to work every day, as long as I'm putting in overtime, it's going to accrue my, uh, my credits towards this specific pension aspect to say, okay, if I want to retire at 55, then I'm going to be receiving X amount of income. If I want to you know, work until I'm 60, I'm going to be receiving a little bit more. If I want to work until I'm 65, I'm going to be receiving a little bit more. So that's the way on how it was basically a table that accelerated the longer that he worked, the more service that he was given, the higher the, the income benefit would have been. So with his situation, he decided to retire when he was in his 50s. And one of the situations there was he could either have received single life income or joint life income. Single life income meaning for just his life, joint life income for both him and my grandmother. Uh, I tell the story in a couple of my other videos. I said that you know he went to uh, he went to go fill out the form. He was walking out the door. He originally checked single life. My grandmother stopped him. She was basically a housewife, so she made sure that everything was was you know perfect at the home with the kids and all of that. So she never worked. She never accrued all these different hours. She didn't have you know other type of employment. So she really relied on their joint retirement income. So by him working and having access to that pension account. They were able to, when she stopped them and she made the change, they were able to receive joint life income. So in that example, and I don't know exactly what the figures were, but let's say that single life income, it was going to give him $80,000 a year of lifetime income to the day he passed away. Whenever, if, so that's single life. If he passed away only after a couple of years, then all that income would stop. There'd be no death benefit left over to her as the beneficiary. Because they took the joint life option, it wasn't that 80000 marker in that example. Maybe it was 60000 
but now 60,000 is going to two individuals. When one spouse passes away, the second spouse will still be living and still be collecting that 60,000 in that example. So, which was really good for her situation because my grandfather ended up passing, they were about a year apart from each other. My grandfather ended up passing away when he was 69 years old. My grandmother ended up living into her 80s. So it was a, math, a great mathematical move for her to stop him and for you know, basically those changes to be made. Uh, he was more fixated on the bright, shiny object. Oh, look at this, I have this extra money and don't worry, I'm not gonna die anytime soon, which unfortunately he was incorrect. He only died about 10 years after that fact. Um, so that explains the pension option. There's a couple different ways on how you could tweak and how you could maximize a pension option, which I'll get into in different, uh, different mistakes that you should be avoiding. Uh, but if we're now looking at the situation of my father, my father worked for different companies, different private companies. So as he was working as an IT director, they were saying, okay, you're going to be receiving you know, X amount of uh, benefits of the life insurance, disability insurance, ancillary benefits, this is gonna be your bonuses, all this stuff. And then also we're gonna give you X amount of percentage of a match into your 401k accounts. So he was placing monies aside, he was going to work. He was placing monies aside every paycheck every pay period so that the combination of his contributions into his, think of it like a bucket, and the matching money was growing that bucket, was at least adding monies into that bucket. And then also based on the investments that he was choosing, that would determine whether or not the bucket was going to be larger at the end of that year or smaller at the end of the year. So anytime that the investments did well, the combination of the contributions and the rate of return side grew that bucket. Whenever those investments went down, it didn't matter how much he contributed from the previous years or what that previous account balance was, that negative from that rate of return side did affect the account. So this is where like, when you look at 2008, when a lot of individuals had uh, downfalls to their, to their 401k accounts, it was because that rate of return side was susceptible to downward market risk. And that when, when basically the, you know, the US markets or the stock market in general went down, individuals felt that, felt that, that, that damage to their 401k accounts basically shrunk that bucket. So when he retired, he had a different systematic process of, okay, how to make sure that I'm properly retiring. With a 401k account, if you have multiple 401ks, anytime that you leave an employer, you're working for a new private employer, a new employer in general, you can take your old 401k account and roll that over into an IRA. So you go in, the reason why somebody would do that is because you have better customization available with an IRA than you would a 401k. So you could basically be, let's say if, you know, throughout somebody's working career, they work for four different companies and they're accumulating 200,000 with old employer uh, A, uh, 200,000 with old employer B, 200,000 with old employer C, and then they end up retiring with employer D and that's accrued another 200,000, you know, sitting in their 401k accounts. Anytime that they left, if they left old employer A, they could have taken that $200,000 bucket, placed it into a uh, IRA account and had that customized to be ideal to what their retirement situation was. There was a lot more flexibility there. Also, when you, when you fast forward and now you have these little micro buckets that are sitting there, either comprised of old 401k monies, of IRA monies, of Roth IRA monies, really whatever the assets were that were accumulated, an individual, because they were not just basically handcuffed to that defined benefit plan, they could go and now customize that out a little bit better. So they could go and create a strategy. Let's say if there's 800,000 sitting at the end of the rainbow, at the, sitting at the end of that pot, uh, when somebody hits a re ideal retirement date at the, for, for their 401k, maybe they could go and say, okay, I wanna take 300,000, place that into a IRA account that's going to trigger $30,000 of income because that's how much of my you know, income gap is going to be, or that's how much I have to uh, at least accomplish what my expenses are. They could go and take a portion of that dollars of, of those dollars and still have about you know five hundred thousand remaining to still have fun with to place it to an emergency need to place it towards a growth related need. So there's there's a multitude of different ways that you could you know kind of mix and match and make sure that's correlated specifically to your goal. So if let's say we're going through an example and we're saying okay my my grandfather's example, what were the benefits of it? Well the benefits were were that he just he didn't have to worry about investing his dollars. He didn't have to worry about okay you know is the market going up is it going down he was relying on his employer to take care of all that for him, to say, as long as I'm giving X amount of years of service, I know that date that I retire, I'm going to be receiving lifetime income, my spouse is going to be receiving lifetime income, the combination of that lifetime income and my social security income was greater than his expenses when he hit retirement age. So he was able to go and do his different hobbies uh, you know, while he was in retirement before he passed away. So it was, uh, you know, it, was, it was definitely a good thing. Pension plans are very good. Now, be mindful that individuals, the status quo was individuals did have pension plans. The majority of individuals were offered pension plans. And then you had a shift that took place. 
Why did that shift take place? Well, let's think about it. What's the risk? If you had an employer that's guaranteeing some sort of retirement benefit and they're setting up this money on the side and they're making sure that everything is set up properly to give this person X amount of lifetime income by the time that they hit X amount of years of service, there's a risk there. So when you had the 401k accounts that came out, and just a really generic concept, there's a little bit more details to it, but when you had 401k accounts that came about, it allowed the employer to get away from the defined benefit plan, to give defined benefits to their employees and say, you know what, let me take the risk away from me and let me place it onto the employee. Let me place it into a defined contribution account and allow somebody to just say, hey, if you wanna contribute, great, you're gonna control your own retirement destiny. That's not our problem. The only thing that we might give you is a match, an incentive to stay with us. So that's, that's really the difference. When you fast forward and now you have that retirement stage where somebody's looking to retire, the pension is it's income. It's, it's some sort of you know guaranteed cash flow. You have income coming to you through the pension. You have uh, social security income coming to you. And hopefully the combination of those two would be greater than or equal to your expenses. If it's not greater than or equal to your expenses, well then you have to look at any other assets that you've accumulated. Maybe you just recently sold a house and you're gonna use that cash account to go and, and try to close up that gap of what your income need is. Uh, maybe that mean, just means downsizing and reducing your expenses. Maybe it means that you know as you were uh, offered a pension plan, you were also placing monies aside into an IRA or a Roth IRA. And now you have that nice fat bucket that's sitting there. Now that's customized to handle your you know, sliver of your income needs, sliver of your emergency needs, sliver of your growth related need. So there's, there's a whole slew of different things you could do when you're offered a pension plan. Now, w one of the things to be mindful of is when individuals are offered pension plans, and let's say they're, they're, they have been retiring or they're, they're set to retire, they may, they may get notices in the mail to say, okay, we understand, and you know, since inception, you understand that if you gave X amount of years of service, we're going to set up this lifetime income amount for you, for both you and your spouse. Instead of taking this income, what if you just forego the income benefit and we will give you a buyout, we will give you a lump sum option. So it's in theory taking it from an income stream into a large bucket that now the individual could invest. The individual could be flexible on their own to create that income need, that growth need, their emergency need, and basically control their own retirement. You know, which is a better route, the pension income or taking the lump sum and then you know, trying to create some sort of retirement plan from it. And it really just depends. If let's say uh, you know, a pension income stream is coming to an individual and it's $50,000 per year, but the lump sum amount is gonna be $700,000, well then let's look underneath the hood and say, can I take 700,000? Can I create some sort of strategy that would allow me to take a sliver of that 700,000, create a max income strategy for 50,000 while still leaving money on the sidelines, while still having leftover monies there. So in that example, maybe it might require that if the person took the, they could either go with the, the pension option, which would only give them the $50,000 per year, but if they decide to take the lump sum option, they could take the lump sum of 700,000, keep it in a qualified status, go leverage 500,000, place it into an IRA that's going to be triggering lifetime income for that 50,000, and now they have 200,000 remaining to play with their either emergency need or accomplish their emergency need or accomplish their growth related need. So that's where the pension plan, if you're offered a pension plan, there could be certain get out options or you might not have that available to you. It might make sense to go and take the lump sum option or it might make more mathematical sense to take the cash flow option and just stay put with the pension income stream because you know that, okay, you know, I have this income gap, this is gonna close my income gap and everything is going to be much better by taking the, the pension option. So like in that example, let's say if a pension plan was giving somebody 700,000, it was giving you, you know, $70,000 per year of income and the buyout option was only 300,000, well, that would make a lot more mathematical sense to go with the pension option because that cash flow is enormous compared to, you know, what the buyout option is. So that's how you could handle really what that, what that pension option is. And if you have specific questions, if you do have a pension plan and you do want to know whether or not it might be appealing to leverage that, that buyout option or just stay put or just really understand where you are right now or where you want to be, what's matching up with your goals, feel free to give us a call 1-800-566-1002. So that's one aspect. The other aspect would be the 401k account. And this is, uh, you know, this is typically majority of Americans. They have these different 401k accounts sitting there or a combination of 401k, IRA, Roth IRA account, non-qualified accounts that are sitting there, but they don't really understand what to do. They just kind of have these portfolios of these buckets sitting there, hoping that's gonna constantly grow, grow, grow. Now, when somebody's trying to accumulate their dollars, that's fine, that sort of strategy would be fine. It's known as a wealth accumulation strategy. But when they start nearing that retirement stage, that's where it makes more sense to take it 
place it into or create more of a wealth preservation and distribution strategy, meaning preserve my monies, make sure that it's not going down in value and creating some sort of income stream or distribution that you could never outlive. So if we have an example where somebody has expenses and let's say that, uh, you know, after doing a budgeting analysis, we understand that their annual expenses are $80,000 per year and they're receiving social security income of $30,000 per year and they don't have any other income streams. They don't have any rental properties. They don't have any pension plans. They don't have any additional cash flows. This is where they would say, okay, well, now let me look at my assets. I have a $50,000 gap here. I have some money sitting in non-qualified accounts, some money sitting in a 401k account. I have some money sitting in an IRA account. How can I go and make sure that I'm creating a proper strategy? And that's where you go off of something called the three things scenario, making sure that you're, you're covering three main bases to give you a, a competent retirement. With the first thing, is going through income sources. So if you know $30,000 is coming to you from social security income, but your expenses are $80,000, that $50,000 gap, you need to close that gap somehow. That's where you, you need to have, you must have an income related strategy off of whatever your remaining assets are. So let's say if you have a combination of non-qualified monies, traditional IRA monies, 401k monies, and that's uh, you know, a million dollar bucket as an example, when you combine all those different sources. Out of those, maybe it might require that you take 500,000 of it and place it into some sort of mechanism into an IRA as an example that could be customized to trigger a lifetime income stream. So now you're doing it more on the individual side to produce that lifetime income so that the combination of the IRA that's producing the 50,000 and the social security income will get you to that $80,000 marker. Step two is the emergency need. So if you have about $80,000 of expenses, maybe you want to leave about $50,000 into just some sort of liquid account or even your non-qualified monies, your checking savings account that you just say, hey, I just want to touch this money at any point in time. I might not need it right now, but in case of an oh my gosh moment was to occur, I could leverage these dollars. So that's another, that's 50,000 from it. So if you start with your overall about million dollar bucket, then you could say, okay, 500,000 was set up in a specific IRA, $50,000 was set up with a non-qualified account. And now I have 450,000 that I could leverage towards that growth related stage. And that growth stage could be handled in a multitude of different ways. Some individuals want to accentuate their growth stage to leave it as an inheritance, do like a max inheritance. Uh, some individuals want to uh, just basically create a type of vacation fund or a grandchild fund, or uh, you know, they, they, they wanna buy a boat and they understand that, or, that every, you know, every week, as long as they could go and fund their, their boating hobby or their golfing hobby or whatever that is, it's really whatever somebody sees as their ideal retirement and, and what they wanna do in their ideal retirement. That's what you could utilize as that growth related strategy. Some individuals only like to leverage fixed accounts. So then it's saying, okay, well, why would you go into risk if you are risk averse? If you only wanna leverage fix, fixed strategies, only leverage fixed strategies. If let's say somebody is more risk tolerant and they absolutely hate fixed accounts because they love the roller coaster rides of the market and they, they really feel confident that they could outperform what the market's doing, well then go into more of a growth related strategy or maybe you could do a combination of both and say, okay, the sliver of dollars remaining, I wanna put a portion to you know, pure growth, I wanna put a portion to pure fix and a portion into really like a hybrid blend, uh, like, a, like a type of protected growth account as an example. So you, it really depends on your situation I hope that these examples have at least helped you guys out in some way where we really come in and we help out individuals on a daily basis is for that individual that either has a defined benefit plan, has a defined contribution plan, and they're just really lost on what to do. They kind of understand that they're gonna be nearing retirement soon or maybe they're, they just approached retirement and now they just kind of have these buckets sitting there and they're saying, I, I don't know what to do. I just you know, did my, my job. I was just employed the whole time. I wasn't a financial advisor. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't wanna learn about the market. So this, this isn't my forte. And that's where we try to help out individuals. We try to educate them, show them what the top strategies are, using math and science to make sure they're using the smallest amount of dollars and only as much as necessary towards that specific area. If you found value in this video, feel free to give our 1-800 number a call. It's 1-800-566-1002. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, RetireSharp, so you can have access to the most updated videos. Thanks so much, guys. Hey.